Welcome. Last video, we examined a large tank battle that happened in northeastern Europe that involved over 1,000 German and Russian tanks. In this video, we will examine another tank battle, but with more than 3,000 German and Russian tanks. That's right, in the Battle of Dubno Brody, up to 3,000 tanks participated. This makes it arguably the largest tank battle ever fought in human history. Similar to what happened in the Battle of Rezanii, the Battle of Dubno Brody was a series of Soviet counterattacks to thwart the German offensive. Taking a look at the raw numbers, the Soviets had eight tank divisions organized into four mechanized corps. The strongest Soviet units were the 8th Mechanized Corps with 171 T-34s and KVs and the 15th Mechanized Corps with 136 T-34s and KVs. The other two Mechanized Corps had basically no modernized tanks. Doing the math, only 13% of Russian tanks were modern tanks, which also happened to be highly resistant if not impervious to German guns. The rest were light tanks like the T-26 and BT-7, which are just useless junk. This is important. If 50% of Russian tanks were T-34s and KVs, not just this battle, but this whole war could have been a lot different. The Germans had four tank divisions organized into two tank corps. About 50% of German tanks were obsolete, like the Panzer I and the Panzer II, while the other 50% were the more modernized Panzer III's and IVs. A total of 585 German tanks participated in this battle. One unique thing I wanted to mention about Soviet tanks, they try to balance out the protection from all sides. What I mean by that is tanks usually have the strongest protection in the front, and weaker protection on the sides and rear. That principle wasn't what the Soviet's designers followed. The T-34 for example had 45mm of sloped armor in the front, and 40mm on the sides and rear. The KV has 75 in the front, 75 on the side, and 70mm in the rear. This means that German guns sometimes couldn't even penetrate the sides or rear of the modernized Russian tanks. In total tank numbers, the Russians outnumber the Germans 4 to 1. However, if you compare the state of the art tanks for both sides, the Germans and Russians were pretty much equal, though the T-34 and the KV were better than the Panzer III's and IVs. However, the Germans made up for their inferior tank numbers with superb organization and training. Each Panzer division was outfitted with more than 2,000 trucks to support just 100 to 200 tanks. The Germans also had complete air superiority, which is very important in a tank battle. There were many disagreements amongst the top commanders on whether or not counterattacks should be delivered. Georgi Drukov, with direct orders from Stalin, personally flew from Moscow to the southwestern front headquarters to command the counterattack. Mikhail Kurpanis, who was the commander in the field, was more realistic about the situation. He realized his troops were simply not ready and needed a few more days to prepare. Ultimately, Drukov won out, and the counteroffensive was officially set to start at 4 a.m. on June 24th. However, at that time, the majority of Soviet units were still moving to their jump-off location. Soviet divisional and corps commanders were forced to leave behind many of their men and material because of this rushed counterattack. The confusion didn't help either. The 8th Mechanized Corps, which was by far the strongest Mechanized Corps, received three different locations to launch their counterattack by various Soviet high commands. Ryabyshev, commander of the 8th Mechanized Corps, said, Around the second half of June 25th, the core units deployed to the northwest of Brody. During the nearly 500 km march, the Corps lost up to half of its older tanks and a substantial portion of its artillery and anti-tank guns to both enemy air attack and mechanical breakdowns. All of the tanks still in service also required varying degrees of maintenance work and were not capable of operating over long distances. Thus, even before the start of the counteroffensive, the Corps found itself in a drastically weakened state. The day is June 26, 1941, and three Soviet mechanized corps finally arrived at their kickoff locations. Originally, the Soviets planned to have six mechanized corps attack together, but hey, three is enough, right? Up top, 
The 13th and 14th Panzer Divisions began battle with the Soviet 9th Tank Corps. The German Panzers gained the upper hand and began to drive back the 9th. Slightly below them, the 11th Panzer Division's spearheads meet the Soviet 19th Mechanized Corps, and they begin battle. The Germans manage to gain the upper hand again, and the 19th is slowly pushed back. The main reason the Soviet 9th and 19th Mechanized Corps did not have success is because they had virtually no T-34s or KVs. In the fight up north, the Germans had better tanks. Down south is where things get interesting. The 16th Panzer Division was informed about the Soviet counterattack and prepares itself. The Soviet attack was quite successful, probably because the Germans couldn't deal with the T-34s and the KVs, and the 16th Panzer Division was pushed back. This exposed the rear flank of the 11th Panzer Division. During the course of the day, the German 29th Infantry Corps continued their march forward. The Soviet 37th Infantry Corps did nothing. They should have moved up to support the 8th Mechanized Corps, but they just sat there and did nothing. The situation was actually quite dire for the Germans at this point. General Franz Helder, Chief of Staff of the OKH, wrote this in his diary. In the Army Group South Sector, heavy fighting continues on the right flank of Panzer Group 1. The Russian 8th Tank Corps has effected a deep penetration of our front and is now in the rear of the 11th Panzer Division. This penetration has seriously disrupted our rear areas between Brody and Dubno. On June 27th, the Soviet 15th Mechanized Corps arrived on the scene of the battle with their 136 T-34 and KBs. Great news for the Russians, right? Now they can hammer their breakthrough home. Except the 15th Mechanized Corps received orders to literally just move from one location to another. I'm not sure if they were even aware that the 8th Mechanized Corps has managed to penetrate all the way to the west of Dubno. Even though they were just miles away from the battle, they basically did not participate in it. Over on the north, the 13th Panzer Division begins flanking the 9th Mechanized, forcing a retreat. The 11th Panzer Division continues its battle with the 19th Mechanized. The 8th Mechanized Corps continues its counterattack and then split itself up. One group was led by Lieutenant General Nikolai Popel. His group swarmed east and attacked the 11th Panzer Division. The 11th was caught off guard and had to retreat all of his forces out of Dubno. The other group, led by General Dmitry Ryabyshev, continued its fight with the 16th Panzer Division while trying to follow Popel. The German 29th Infantry Corps continued marching forward while the Soviet 37th Infantry Corps just kept waiting. The Germans suddenly found themselves in a precarious situation. The 11th Infantry Division is surrounded and cut off from all other German units. The Soviets may not be able to defeat all German units in this fight, but if they can destroy the 11th Panzer Division, they would have significantly delayed the southern German advance into Russia. The day is now June 28th. Fighting continued in the north. The commander of the 9th Mechanized, the famous General Konstantin Rokossovsky, who would go on to become one of Stalin's favorite generals, refused to obey Drukov's order to continue the counterattack and instead decided to retreat and set up defensive positions. The 13th and 14th Divisions pursued him off the map. The 11th Panzer Division is now forced into fighting a two-front battle. However, to their surprise, General Popo decided to stop his group at Dobno and wait for reinforcements. The German 29th Infantry Corps has finally arrived at the scene of the battle and began to engage Soviet 8th Mechanized. By the end of this day, any chances of a Soviet victory in this battle is now gone. The 8th Mechanized did not press their advantage and instead decided to wait for reinforcements. The German infantry has arrived and now the 8th Mechanized is heavily outnumbered with no reinforcements in sight. On June 29th, the Germans surrounded Popo's group near Dubno. Popo and Ryabyshev continued to fight until July 1st when they finally decided to retreat. The battle was over, thanks to terrible Soviet coordination and German air superiority. The Soviet losses for this battle was enormous, and their counterattack efforts have destabilized the entire southern front. The 15th Mechanized Corps lost 91% of their tanks, 
from their original 749, the 8th mechanized lost 95% of their tanks, the 19th mechanized lost 93% of their tanks, and the 9th mechanized was virtually destroyed in the fighting. They were disbanded later in the year. A lot of these losses were not actually combat losses, but lost due to mechanical failure. German losses were also comparatively huge. I couldn't find any good sources on German losses for this particular battle, but a Russian source said that the 11th and 16th Panzer Divisions lost about 200 from their original 289 tanks. That's just under 70% of their strength. It's amazing how the Germans kept up their blitzkrieg into the vast landscape of Russia after this battle. I think this battle is a great exemplar of the Soviet army in the beginning stages of Operation Barbarossa. The 8th Mechanized Corps alone with their 171 KV and T-34 tanks was almost able to make the German flank collapse. Which shows that Soviet troops were capable fighters if properly supplied and if they have a capable commander. However, the Soviet high command was a mess and sent the 15th mechanized with their 136 KV and T-34 tanks to just drive around and do absolutely nothing. That's it for this video. Next video we will examine the Great Battle of Smolensk, a crucial battle fought over a city that lied on the direct path to Moscow. Just to give you an idea of how large the Battle of Smolensk was, there were over 800,000 total German and Soviet casualties.